What would you answer if you were asked, what is your favorite pasuk in the Torah? Well, we're all familiar with the answer that Rabbi Akiva gave, love your neighbor like yourself. What we're less familiar with is the answer given by Azai in the same Midrash. Ben Azai quotes from Genesis 5.1 as follows. This is the book of the descendants of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. This is a great principle of the Torah. For Ben Azai, the greatest verse introduces the idea that all human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. This is the verse should, that should instruct and infuse our lives with meaning. This is the verse that should first and foremost inspire us. It is not a verse about chosenness and Torah or mitzvah. It's a verse that essentially reveals that all human beings, regardless of gender, color, race, or religion, are created with a tzalem elokim, with a divine spark. And this is actually what is unique among all of God's creatures, that human beings are created with the spark of divinity. With that introduction, I want to segue into a halakhic principle, the principle of kvod habriot, or human dignity. We're first introduced to the principle in the Tosefta in Baba Kama, where Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai rules that a man who steals an ox pays a payment of fivefold, but a man who steals a sheep pays only fourfold. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai explains that this is because when he steals the ox, he leads it from the pen. But when he steals the sheep, he slings it over his shoulders and incurs a certain amount of humiliation in the act of the theft. And because he compromises his quote habriot, and here Rabbi Yohanan Mizakai uses quote habriot, human dignity, to explain why he actually pays a lesser penalty than the person who steals an ox. Now, human dignity is an interesting but very fast and complicated concept. Dignity is ambiguous. How do you define dignity? Well, if I look in the dictionary, it says it's the state or quality of being worthy of honor or respect. But that's highly subjective and can vary from person to person. How can I translate that into a practical halakhic application? Well, if I look at the Yerushalmi, I have already Zera the elder saying, great is human dignity, for it overrides even a negative precept in the Torah for one hour. The Jerusalem Talmud recognizes the far-reaching implication of this halakhic principle, and nonetheless, without fanfare or definition, suggests that when there's a compromise between man's dignity, man who is created in the image of God, and God's Torah, man is allowed to preserve his dignity even in, uh, on the chance that he will violate a precept from the Torah. How far this might have gone is unknown because the Babylonian Talmud comes in and recognizes that this could result in a far-reaching dilution of Torah law. If a person is embarrassed by a particular mitzvah, is he then able to employ this justification to break the Torah, to preserve his dignity? To the Babylonian Talmud, that seems a little bit too far-reaching. And so in Masechet Brachot and a few other places, it looks at the, uh, the, the discussion from different angles. It looks at the principle. On one hand, the Yerushalmi is clearly bringing a concept that is deeply rooted in Tanaitic literature, this idea of greatest human dignity. On the other hand, allowing it to be used to override doraitas, or biblical law, seems dangerous. And so they conclude that it does override one negative principle, the negative principle that says you must follow rabbinic law. So there's something brilliant in what they do. They preserve the dignity and the integrity of the Jerusalem Talmud, but they also protect and create a fence around the use of human dignity as a principle that will allow overriding Doraita, or Torah law. The Talmud essentially brings three examples in which human dignity allows the violation of law. And it makes, takes great pains in each of these cases to explain why the violations are only rabbinic. The three examples are quintessential situations in which human dignity is trampled. Nudity, nakedness, human waste, going to the bathroom, and death. In all three cases, the Talmud justifies violating rabbinic law if the person will be rendered naked otherwise, exposed or left unable to clean himself after using the bathroom, and allows the removal of a dead body from the sun and Shabbat. All three of these situations reflect the uniqueness of the human being with regard to his or her body and uphold the idea that our embodiment of Salam al allows for a certain relaxation of practice, 
even though it brings us into conflict with God's will that we obey halakha, because the necessity of preserving dignity is unique to mankind. Well, that's very limited. But in the Middle Ages, the Maharam of Wittenberg, where he mayor, he basically is asked about a person who comes into shul, into synagogue, and discovers that his talit is missing one of the four fringes, rendering the talit pasul and essentially muktza, because on Shabbat he can't fix it. The question is, can he wrap himself in the talit without a bracha in order to look like everyone else? And here the Maharam says yes. In order to avoid embarrassment, because of Kvod Habriot, he uses that language, you can allow someone to essentially use a talit that is muktza in order to preserve his dignity. And here, really, we have something very distinct and different from the nakedness, bathroom, death models. In other words, this idea of the subjectivity of human dignity, of a person who stands out in Beit Knesset because he's not wearing a talit, says the Maharam is justification for violating the law of Mukta. This comes up again in a tshuva in the Ramah. The Ramah in, a, uh, in Ebena Ezer um, is quoted after, so the Shulchan Aruch says we don't get married on Shabbat. The Ramah says, but there are cases where we do allow marriage on Shabbat. For instance, if someone has never been married before. Whenever there's something that oblique, there's usually a story behind it. And so if you go into responsa 125 in the Ramah, you hear a fascinating and very sad story of a young orphan, a girl, who was betrothed before her father died. And when she came of age and it was time to marry her, and in Krakow they got married on Fridays, the remaining family refused to pay the dowry. The neighboring women told the young girl, go to the mikvah the night before the wedding, put on your veil, it will be okay. Unfortunately, come Friday, it wasn't okay. The family refused to hand over the dowry. The groom and his family dug their heels in and refused to allow the marriage to go through. The Ramah, Rav Moshe Iserlis, the greatest posek in Krakow, begs and pleads with the family to no avail. Finally, an hour and a half into Shabbat, the groom relents, and the Ramah ups and marries the couple. In the aftermath, there's tremendous controversy, and his rabbinic colleagues attack him for this act. In his beautiful tshuva, where he talks over and over again of how could we have left this virginal daughter of Israel essentially standing abandoned at the altar, he invokes the principle of Kvod Habriot, and he explains that that justifies doing what he says is only a quasi-violation of rabbinic law. In more contemporary literature, this principle has been used when it comes to allowing hearing aids, that Tzitz Eliezer brings it as justification to allow someone back in the days where hearing aids were actually quite big and cumbersome, to wear them on Shabbat, question of carrying possibly, or mukta. And um, it's also used to allow a woman who has lost her eyebrows to tattoo in eyebrows so that she does not stand out. More recently, when I was in, uh, very recently actually, um, I, I uh, belonged to an interfaith dialogue, I participated in an interfaith dialogue, and I brought in texts about Claude Habriot, human dignity, to see if we could use that more in a philosophical way as a way of bridging uh, gaps and bridging conflict and recognizing that we're all created in the image of God. I was also at a big Hillel uh, seminar where we talked about disabilities and integrating these people with disabilities into the community. And Rav Amit Kula suggested that Kvod HaBriot might be halakhic justification to force synagogues and mikvahs to build access for disabled people to be able to come into synagogues and mikvahot. Again, he used the principle possibly of Kvod HaBriot. What I'd like to conclude with, that although this is a powerful principle, it is actually rarely used. And this is something that was brought up by Rav Aaron Lichtenstein. And I'd like to read a quote from an essay he wrote called Ma Enosh, Reflections on the Relation Between Judaism and Humanism. And he poses a question to the halakhic community, and I would like to end with that question. The Gemara does not merely state, as it does in comparable cases elsewhere, that Kvod HaBriot overrides the usual norms in certain situations. It states, rather, great is human dignity so that it overrides a negative precept of the Torah. Consequently, the failure to invoke these dispensations in any but the most extreme cases cannot but erode their position, and popular awareness of that position as central values within the Torah halakhic order. No committed Jew can regard such a prospect lightly. Some margin of safety is perhaps advisable, but must it be as large as we have tended to maintain? Thank you very much.